The government has the numbers to defeat all the amendments, assuming they're, they're all there. So I guess the larger goal, what do, you, what do you hope this will accomplish by putting forward so many of the amendments? Well, the first thing, of course, is that it's um, parliamentary democracy requires that we actually not operate as a large rubber stamp for a majority government. Parliamentary democracy means that you have a loyal opposition. And where they have fast-tracked committee hearings and refused to accept a single amendment to all 420 pages of 70 laws being changed, it boggles the mind that in the committee process they couldn't find a single amendment on which they were prepared to bend. So at report stage, this is our tradition. This is Parliament. We have an opportunity to pass amendments that are, that are realistic, and some of my amendments, I hope, some will pass. Now, the other aspect of this, of course, is depending on how many individual votes the Speaker approves, say we go from 870 amendments that are votable to uh, compressing the number of amendments to, say, 400 votes. I find as a rough rule of thumb it's about four votes per hour, so that's 100 hours of voting. As we face the prospect of nonstop voting for 100 hours, it's my hope that, the, um, that Stephen Harper, Jim Flaherty, Peter Van Loan, all the people involved in this legislation will have pause and it gives them a moment to reflect, to listen to what they're hearing from former fisheries ministers from the, uh, you know, from the voice of, I heard John Fraser's quote this morning, I did CBC Radio to Vancouver, and John Fraser, as former fisheries minister, is pleading to say these changes are dangerous, you can't pass these changes. Tom Sidden, former fisheries minister, also conservative. Bob Mills, former Reform Alliance and conservative, all pleading with their own party to rethink this legislation, pull the bill back and fix it. These amendments create the opportunity for compromise. These amendments mean that Stephen Harper should think, can I really count on all of my members never fading over 100 hours of voting and accidentally letting one of the uh, Green Party amendments go through, uh, accidentally allowing the National Roundtable to survive? Wouldn't it be better to do it on purpose, to rethink what's going on here and allow for a proper review of C-38, accept some of my amendments as one route? pull back parts of the bill is another route, but we have to have some openness in parliamentary democracy to ensure that an omnibus budget implementation bill doesn't go through with just one big rubber stamp when so many knowledgeable, credible, third-party experts and even conservative ex-ministers are pleading with the government to reconsider. Point of order. One of your central arguments is that there's a lot of stuff in the budget bill that really you can't make any logical link to no. a budget bill. In your mind, what's the most egregious example of that? It's, it's hard to pick the most egregious. I think destruction of the fisheries habitat is, is just outrageous because we'd heard, if you reconstruct the way this, this issue was raised, we first heard that the government might be planning to destroy the, the Section 35.1 of the Fisheries Act through a leaked memo through a former fisheries biologist named Otto Langer. And so, of course, when I started reading this on March 29th, I was looking frantically for any sign that the Fisheries Act might be under the gun. Reading this budget, you conclude, okay, no, that was a, that was a maybe that was a, a, a trial balloon. That's not a risk anymore. There's no reference. I had I, people in journalism were saying, well, gee, it must have been that the environmentalists panicked over something that, that there wasn't a shred of truth to the idea they were going after Fisheries Act and Habitat. And then you get C-38, and it's just devastating. You just, it, it's far more shocking than even the advanced rumors that reached Otto Langer's ears actually were. So that's egregious. I think, I wish one of my amendments hadn't been ruled out of order. I tried to delete the clause that removed the Inspector General from the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. So my amendment on that was ruled out of order. I don't know whether that's because um, an NDP or Liberal amendment accomplishes the same thing. We need to, to get through all these to find out. But I think that's quite outrageous in the context of a budget bill. I also think these provisions that say um, under the, um, the idea that you can have the arrest of Canadians on Canadian soil by U.S. law enforcement agents, I think that's I mean, there's so many aspects. You just think this, you know, how many more things are we going to discover? I think I've read, I've read Bill C-38 a number of times now. I don't think there's anything in there I don't know about. But we shouldn't have had, you know, no brief, no advance briefing, 
uh, this thing was just dropped in as if there was nothing to worry about here. And of course, as you saw in my point of order, numerous claims by government ministers of what C-38 will do are not mentioned at all. And many things that are in C-38 have no connection to the budget at all. I, I have to ask myself sometimes, if these members of parliament for the Conservative Party, don't, have, have, have you no shame? Don't you know what legislation is supposed to do? It's not supposed to be a vast plot to run things by Parliament without proper review. Any sense as to why they, they have put, for example, that point you made about the Inspector General of CSIS being deleted? Do you have any sense why they would put that kind of stuff in a budget bill? To avoid scrutiny. I mean, the answer is, I mean, I think, I think in most cases, the obvious answer shouldn't be rejected. <laughs> if you're trying to, you know, when I look at something like Bill C-36, Bill C-36, by the way, will get full scrutiny in Parliament goes to first reading, second reading, committee. We'll, we'll have a lot of time on Bill C-36. It's four paragraphs long. It amends one subclause of the criminal code. It's not as though for efficiency's sake Stephen Harper wants all laws compressed into one omnibus bill all the time. The ones he doesn't want you to notice are compressed in an omnibus bill. The ones they want to put out in the front window, like C-36 has the grandiose title that it's a, uh, an act to prevent seniors abuse. All it does actually is allow for, at time of sentencing, a judge to consider the situation of the victim at the time of the assault. It's, you know, it's, it's, I, I, there's a lot I'd like to do to help seniors in this country against abuse, and I don't have any problem with C-36. But just in a contrast, C-36 is getting the full treatment of its own review in a committee, its own opportunity to have witnesses. And 70 bills are changed through C-38 with time allocation and, you know, running roughshod over hundreds of years of parliamentary tradition and democracy. This is the most egregious piece of legislation ever tabled, certainly in Canada. And they can't expect us to roll over and play dead when they when 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 this kind of outrage is put in front of us. Yeah. There's some confusion um, over you know, how many of these votes exactly are are confidence votes. Um, liberals this morning said they don't know. Nathan Collinson suggests many of them are. What's your understanding? I you know my view is that a, a confidence vote relates to a money bill, and this isn't a money bill. So I remain to be convinced that any of them are confidence motions. Budget, budget implementation bill, how is it not a money bill? Though? But it, it doesn't implement the budget. I know, it's one of those tricky word things, isn't it? There's nothing in the budget implementation bill that is about spending money. Any more than any other piece of legislation. I mean, every piece of legislation that comes from the government. I mean, if you're going to look at um, uh, the, uh, the legislation on uh, the omnibus crime bill, obviously that involved a lot of money and particularly downloaded on the provinces because they'll have to build the jails. That doesn't make it a money bill. The main estimates, clearly, the main estimates which we voted on last week are making sure the money flows. So the average, I mean, I know a lot of Canadians, based on what I get as Twitter questions, my, my you know, taking the pulse of the average Canadian, what am I being tweeted about? People are wondering, well, are you going to hold up the money so federal civil servants can't get paid? No. C-38 has absolutely nothing to do with the money that runs the government, that pays civil servants, that keeps things ticking along. This is a package of measures that Stephen Harper is claiming are necessary legislative changes to meet what they've promised to do in the budget. As such, I think that's why we have this gray area question of is it a, is it a confidence vote, vote or not. Um, I remain to be convinced that any of the votes, particularly votes on amendments, are not confidence votes for sure. Votes on C-38 as a whole, that's a question. Concerned at all that uh, Canadians might see this as uh, procedural uh, uh, wrangling, theatrics, uh, just more shenanigans in the House of Commons? And uh, the second part of that, do you really think they're paying attention to what's at stake here? Well. Obviously, Peter Van Loan and the spin doctors in PMO are trying to paint any effort by opposition parties to stop Bill C-38 from being passed as is. And I think that's the important thing to stress here. We're trying to stop a really egregious piece of legislation from being passed as is. That's our duty as parliamentarians.
It's no, there's no new trick here. It's not a filibuster. I know the word filibuster got used in some newspapers. Filibusters are when you talk and talk and talk and keep the, the change the timelines within parliament. This isn't, this is our right as parliamentarians to have standing recorded votes. If five MPs stand up, you have to have a standing recorded vote. That's the rules. So the fact that it will take a very long time, again, is directly the result of the, of, of, the, of the mammoth piece of legislation before us. If Mr. Harper wants to have bills that pass quickly and don't have a lot of amendments at report stage, he should not illegitimately put 70 pieces of legislation in one bill. So that's, now how Canadians see it, I'm hoping desperately, and I, I certainly the movement against C-38 is building. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities, I think it was very significant. They took an emergency vote in their weekend meeting last weekend in Saskatoon to urge the Prime Minister to pull all the environmental laws out of C-38. Now this is the very same group that the Minister of Fisheries keeps claiming had been clamoring to get these changes. Right? So to the extent that there was an artifice of support for these measures, it is crumbling. And, you know, when you've got Bob Mills saying it's a terrible mistake to destroy the National Roundtable, you've got ministers of fisheries of all political stripes, well, federal, federal liberals and progressive conservatives saying, don't do this. It's reckless. You can lose whole year classes of wild salmon from a temporary destruction of their habitat. And that's what they're now approving in C-38. So all I can hope is that by explaining what we're doing, by being conscientious, and I know Nathan Cullen's explaining what the NDP are doing, and I know Mark Garneau's out there explaining what the Liberals are doing. We are trying, as an opposition, to do our job. And to the extent that democracy is inconvenient for Mr. Harper, I would ask him to rethink what parliamentary democracy is about. Dictatorships make very quick decision making, but we don't live in a dictatorship, we live in a democracy. Pour beaucoup de décisions entre les mains de, du président de la Chambre. D'abord, il doit décider oui. sur votre point légal, ensuite sur les amendements. Est-ce que vous avez confiance que le président va prendre la décision qui s'impose? Oui, c'est très difficile pour... Euh, c'est une question... C'est la question clé. Pour moi-même, j'ai confiance dans le rôle d'un président de Chambre de commune parce que il, il, il doit changer son approche. Il n'y a pas... À le moment qu'il était élu, il n'est pas à, à la, ce moment conservateur, pas du tout. Il, était le, il, il a devenu comme président de chambre de commune, c'est un rôle comme un juge. C'est important pour, pour lui de penser et réfléchir d'une façon non partisanale. Et j'espère que oui, euh, j'ai confiance en lui. C'est la question égale, légale sur les points de règlement. C'est très important, c'est une question historique. Et après ça, si il ne donner son appui pour moi, point de règlement, réglementation. Nous avons encore les décisions au sujet de le groupe des amendements. Mais je, pour, la, pour la santé de la vraie démocratie au Canada, le, le rôle de président de Chambre de communes, c'est très important. Et pour moi-même, j'ai confiance dans son rôle. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Brief points, if I can, Ms. May. Uh, Speaker Scheer. Yeah. His Previous rulings in unrelated cases, I'm thinking of points of privilege by Mr. Cutler and Mr. Taves, were acknowledged to be unprecedented and very conservative friendly. At what point do, from your point of view, appeals to the impartiality of Speaker Scheer become touching, naive, and pointless? I'd like to say never. The role of members of parliament in relation to a speaker and to, for one minute, impugn the speaker's motives or to suggest that he or she operates in a partisan fashion is actually an affront to parliament as a whole. And it is offensive to parliamentary democracy and to tradition to, to malign the speaker or to assume that he won't give a fair ruling. So I'm very, as you can see, I'm very old school. Um, you could you could be one of the first or maybe not the first to say it's naive but I think we have to you know in uh, when I finished my point of order that line that parliamentarians we are the bulwark of democracy in this country we must exercise our rights and responsibilities and obligations seriously and in this case uh, democracy is slipping away in Canada we must protect where we can the 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 principle 
that legislative changes go through a proper parliamentary process, even if you know, as Jason mentioned earlier, that at the end of the day, the conservative members of parliament have the majority of seats. One should never presume that the whole exercise of parliament is some sort of charade. We must use our rights and responsibilities as parliamentarians on behalf of our constituents, and we have to have faith that the Speaker of the House will rule fairly. Otherwise, it does become a complete charade. Leads me to my second question. You were in the House when the bill was introduced uh, on second before Mr. Van Loan served notice of closure. Mm -hmm. You've had the benefit of conversations with Parliamentary Council, I presume. Could you not have started to introduce amendments then? Uh, my, amend my ability to introduce amendments are, as I understand it, really for report stage. The difficulty with producing amendments before it has gone through committee is that the, you know, you can't, my amendments can't duplicate anything that was put forward at committee. Committee. Yeah. Could you have done it before he moved it's that an, motion? It's an interesting question. Number one, I, I don't think we could have, but as a practical reality, it took weeks to develop. I mean, these are, these are not, um, you know, to, the, okay. Now that closure's moved, we, we get into these fake fights, it's been called. Mm -hmm. This is not, uh, this is not a derogatory thing, but the, the Im impression is left that this will be a colorful and ultimately ineffectual protest against a bill where the product of the opposition is at odds with the rhetoric of the opposition. If you really wanted to kill a bill, you wouldn't hold a news conference talking about the amendments. You would start to move them on the floor as soon as you saw your your chance so my, before closure came in, would you not? No, I don't think I could have done that procedurally. My opportunity as someone who isn't sitting on committee, to, you can move amendments only once. I mean, the, I don't think the journals would even have accepted them. You have to go through second reading, complete the committee process. At that moment, amendments are possible, and we had to draft amendments constantly bearing in mind that if one of the opposition parties moved amendments, or the government in the committee moved amendments that were identical to ours, we could no longer move them. We also know that at the very beginning of C-38, we were told by uh, both House leaders that there was a negotiation underway between the official opposition and the government in terms of splitting the bill and pulling out those pieces that don't have anything to do with the budget. So my opportunities to put forward amendments, and I've done this on every single piece of legislation for the last since I was elected to the House of Commons. I had 42 amendments on the omnibus crime bill. This is appropriate parliamentary process. This is not a subversion of process. This is not some kind of stunt. This is a legitimate attempt to ensure this bill does not pass as written and is improved. And you know, to say it's an ineffectual protest, that's the kind of thing that Peter Van Loan will obviously say is completely untrue. We do not know how this bill will come out through report stage until we have voted one at a time on every single one of these amendments. And then we'll see how the bill looks at the end of the day. Meanwhile, we have to hope that there will be some willingness on the part of Stephen Harper's cabinet members and himself, obviously, since he runs everything, to rethink this to agree that it would be a good thing and that Canadians would appreciate it if they saw a willingness to compromise. I'm certainly willing to compromise to get the most important aspects of my amendments passed if there's a willingness on the part of the government to support my amendments. This is, this is critical stuff. This is not political theater. This is, does the federal government have the tools that the Constitution demands of the federal government to ensure that fish habitat is protected? Do we have the constitutional tools and the legal tools to ensure that before projects go ahead, we exercise due diligence to avoid disastrous mistakes? That's all environmental assessment law is. That's what the Fisheries Act is all about. And to have them destroyed with a minimal number of hours of hearing witnesses without a single hearing before the Fisheries Committee or the Environment Committee, not, not taking these bills on their own merit and allowing Canadians to know what's going on, is an affront to democracy. That's why it really matters to ensure that these amendments are heard. And the reason I'm holding a press conference is because I want people to understand, particularly Canadians, to understand that I'm not saying no to those sound bites that you hear over and over again from Joe Oliver and Stephen Harper. This is my amendments are not about saying you can't put a time limit on a panel review. That's still in here. My amendments are saying you can't destroy the entire 
legislative scheme. What they've done, and according to environmental law experts I heard before the subcommittee on finance, because although I wasn't a member, I attended the hearings, this new approach to C-38, to it, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, as they're now calling SIA 2012, will, add, and also Grand Ch National Chief Sean Atlio said the same thing, will lead to more uncertainty, more delays, more conflict, more lawsuits, They've put forward terms that have not been defined by courts. They've put forward terms that they've left out of the definition section. This is shoddily drafted, right? This is bad legislation, not just because it hurts the environment, and I'm an environmentalist. As a lawyer looking at this, bad drafting. Yeah. That, or are you hopeful that some conservative MPs will stand up and vote in favor of your amendment? I think at this point, uh, you know, that's something you have to ask conservative backbenchers. I think the experience that uh, Dave Wilkes went through, having been publicly quoted as someone who was prepared to oppose this bill to quickly recant, I think that the um, there is not a message to conservatives from Stephen Harper that they will be forgiven if they um, support amendments within this bill. The question is, if we go through two or three days of voting, how many people keep standing up to vote with the government? At some point, our amendments could pass just because people aren't in the room or get too sleepy. You haven't heard from uh, any members of the government that they, you know, even privately support your efforts? Well, of course, a lot of conservatives privately support my efforts. Whether they're prepared to stand up and say so, I, I certainly... I, I, you know, that's for them to decide. They would, they're obviously, I think a lot of Canadians would be cheering. We know there's a campaign out now that, that sort of sprung from Dave Wilkes's YouTube video clip to say, okay, we're looking for 13 heroes. Where are 13 heroes? There are, you know, the majority of Canadians, uh, in terms of how people voted a year ago, the majority of Canadians didn't support conservative candidates. But in fairness, a lot of people who voted conservative would never have supported these measures because these measures were never discussed in an election. I've heard privately from some conservatives. Oh, of course. I have a lot of friends in all the different parts of the parliament and I respect confidences. Have you heard that there may be a willingness on the side of the government to support any of your amendments at all? Well, I think what we have to do is see I me mean, at this point, obviously Peter Van Loan's hoping that these amendments will be you know, bunched together in so few votes that there isn't any leverage. So the question for negotiating and leverage, and of course in half an hour we'll know if the speaker has accepted my point of order and thrown the whole bill out, but if that doesn't occur, where's, where's the pressure and where's the leverage for Stephen Harper to agree to compromise? The leverage is created by the hour's worth of voting and the risk that some amendments could pass just because it goes beyond human endurance to ask people to vote round the clock for 100 hours. I think in fairness to his own caucus, uh, the uh, Prime Minister should reconsider and agree to sit down and come up with a version of C-38 that is acceptable not only to me, but obviously the op official opposition, the Liberal Party, and so on, so that Canadians have a piece of legislation that doesn't do long-term damage to the health of nature in Canada. But all depending on how they're grouping, you know, we don't know yet, we will know as you mentioned, but do you think that there's a chance the government might consider even one of your amendments. Of course. Why wouldn't they? I mean, if you're facing the prospect of losing a number of amendments through attrition, why not be reasonable, sit down, especially since as I, I, I hope I've made it clear, the things they say their amendments are about are respected in my amendments. Right? So, you know, unless they want to come out and actually say that they deliberately wanted to destroy certainty in environmental reviews, deliberately wanted to remove the federal role, deliberately wanted to create a situation where fisheries habitat was no longer protected. Assuming that those are accidents of drafting, my amendments fix them. And I like to assume the best of people until proven otherwise. Thanks. Oh. How are you going to survive, you know, possibly 60 plus hours of voting? Well, um, I... I I have a, an experience of having done such things as worked three, four hours, three, three to four days straight through UN negotiations. They tend to run round the clock when we're doing climate negotiations or before that, back 20 years ago in Rio. Of course, I was younger then. Uh, but I think it's a question of you, you steel yourself to what needs to be done, uh, ground yourself. And I always, you know, I, this is, if this was something that was just a theatrical adventure, 
you wouldn't last. But when you're grounded in principle and you know what's at stake, you steel yourself for the task. You commit yourself to saying, okay, it's going to be a matter of mind over matter. However long it takes, I'm not yielding. And that's my current frame of mind. Thank you.